So today we're going to talk about suffering and flourishing. From the patristic period onward, the Christian tradition has supposed that those who endure serious suffering are not the pitiable losers of life or even the heroic overcomers of tragedy, but rather are those specially loved by God. That is because on this view, suffering is not only medicinal for the human condition, it is also a gift of God's to those who are nearer to God. The great patristic thinker John Chrysostom says of people who are scandalized at the sight of human suffering, he says, those people do not know that to have these sufferings is the privilege of those specially dear to God. In this lecture, I want to look closely at the relevant Christian doctrines to see what can be said to explain this attitude toward suffering. There is a biblical text in 2 Corinthians that expresses the relevant Christian attitude in a paradigmatic way, and it will be helpful to approach the examination of suffering through the claims in that text. In 2 Corinthians, Paul makes this claim, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so also our consolations abound through Christ. According to this claim, for a suffering person in grace in this life, her suffering is somehow correlated with the consolation she has in or with Christ. The comfort and help a sufferer has from Christ can intensify as her suffering increases. Later in the same epistle, Paul says, Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are all changed into the same image, from glory into glory through the Spirit, the Lord. And Paul goes on to connect the glory of that union with suffering in this way. Our light afflictions, which last only for the moment, bring about for us a far greater eternal weight of glory. In other words, according to Paul in this epistle, the suffering endured by a person in grace is one source of that person's glory or spiritual loveliness. To begin to understand Paul's thought about suffering, consolation, and glory, it's necessary to work slowly through its elements, beginning with the nature and effects of suffering. On Paul's thought in the epistle, something about suffering, which seems to deprive a person of flourishing, actually enables or enhances the flourishing of the sufferer. Although discussions of human flourishing are by now something of a cottage industry, for my purposes here, a person's flourishing can be thought of as his thriving. So understood the opposite of thriving is not being sick, it's rather something like being dysfunctional. The failure to thrive is a broad category that encompasses any kind of impairment or impediment to the proper functioning of some part of a person or even of the whole person himself. It is evident that thriving comes in different modes. To begin with, we can distinguish the thriving a person has when he suffers no impediments as regards his body from the thriving he has when he suffers no impediments as regards his mind. We can think of thriving that is either as bodily thriving or as thriving of the mind, and it is possible to have one of these modes of thriving without the other. So for example, there are people who are in excellent bodily condition, but who suffer from mental illness or some other impediment of mind. Buzz Aldrin was in peak athletic condition when he flew to the moon in 1969, but he later acknowledged that he also suffered from serious depression. On the other hand, clearly it is possible to have great bodily impediments but to be thriving in mind. Harriet McBride Johnson is an example. She was a highly accomplished, highly intelligent disability rights activist, but she had very serious bodily impairments. There is a general consensus that other things being equal, thriving in mind outranks bodily thriving. Few people would be willing to trade diminished bodily thriving for comparable diminishments of thriving in mind. And this common attitude seems right. On the scale of value commonly found in the Christian tradition and much contemporary thought, the best thing for human beings is a matter of relationships. And if they are serious enough, impediments with regard to thriving in mind are more of a barrier to relationships 
than roughly comparable impediments to bodily thriving are, other things being equal. And yet, even for human beings with serious cognitive impairments, meaningful and fulfilling relationships of love are possible. Furthermore, on the traditional Christian scale of value, the greatest human relationship is with God, and so the greatest thriving for a human person is in that relationship. And even serious impediments to thriving in mind are not a bar to a human person's relationship with God. Consider, for example, this report of religious experience on the part of someone suffering from significant mental illness. He says, at one time, I reached utter despair and wept and prayed to God for mercy instinctively and without faith in reply. That night, I stood with other patients in the grounds of the hospital waiting to be let into our ward. And suddenly someone stood beside me and a voice said, mad or sane, you are one of my sheep. I never spoke to anyone of this, but ever since 20 years, it has been the pivot of my life. Even among those with both bodily thriving and thriving in mind, few people have such powerful religious experiences. The religious experience this patient reports was so great as to center his life for a long time on his own telling of the story and to bring him consolation throughout that whole period. The closeness to God of the original experience and the ongoing relationship with God it provoked, they were great enough to endure through many years of this patient's life. What such considerations should help us recognize is that bodily thriving and thriving in mind do not exhaust the modes of thriving for human beings. A human person can have impediments to thriving of both body and mind, and yet that person can have thriving as a human person. So there is a third mode of thriving. Harriet Tubman seems to me a good example of this third mode of thriving. She was born a slave, and from early childhood, she was recurrently separated from her family. When she was six or seven, for example, she was farmed out to a different household as a house slave and nanny. In that job, child though she was, she endured severe beatings, and she was often deprived of sufficient food and adequate clothing. Later in life, as a result of the abuse of one slave master, she suffered a serious head wound, which left her with lasting neurological problems. Throughout the rest of her life, she seems to have suffered from narcolepsy and other manifestations of brain damage as a result of that injury. It is difficult to believe that in addition to the neurological problems she suffered, she did not also have lasting psychological damage from the trauma of the abuse she endured as a child. And this is only the beginning. The story of the suffering of her life is too great to be summarized adequately in short space here. And it's hard to read even in abbreviated form because the cruelty inflicted on her is heartbreaking. When she was a young woman, Tubman succeeded in escaping from slavery and she spent all the rest of her long life rescuing other slaves and working for the abolition of slavery, often in perilous circumstances. When a biography of her was being prepared during her lifetime, she asked Frederick Douglass to write a recommendation for the cover of the book. And this is what he, so worthy of honor himself, this is what he wrote to her. He said, you ask for what you do not need when you call upon me for a word of commendation. I need such words from you far more than you can need them from me especially where your superior labors and devotion to the cause of the lately enslaved of our land are known as I know them. I know of no one who has willingly encountered more perils and hardships to serve our enslaved people than you have. The great honor in which Harriet Tubman was and is so rightly held by so many people, me included, that bears witness to her thriving as a human being. She is not a bent or broken or otherwise failing specimen of the human species. On the contrary, she is a shining example of humanity. And we do not honor her out of compassion as someone who heroically overcame the tragic circumstances of her life. Rather, anyone with integrity has to acknowledge that she sets a standard for human greatness 
and so also for thriving as a human being. But she had that thriving with serious impediments to thriving of body and thriving of mind. It's hard to know exactly what to call this third mode of thriving, but because it is somehow the thriving of the whole person rather than the thriving of a part of a person, as thriving of body or thriving of mind is, I'm going to call this third mode personal thriving for lack of a better term. So thriving of body and thriving of mind are neither individually necessary nor jointly sufficient for personal thriving. And because it is the thriving of the whole person, personal thriving outranks thriving of either of the other two modes or even of both of them combined. So human flourishing is not just a matter of thriving in body or thriving in mind or both. Human flourishing is a matter of thriving as a whole person. And this thriving can occur even when a person suffers from significant impediments as regards both mind and body. As the example of Harriet Tubman illustrates, the depredations of other human beings, the consequences of severe poverty, the misfortunes of nature, and other similar afflictions cannot take away from a sufferer the possibility of flourishing. For even resplendent human flourishing, it is not necessary that the impediments to thriving of mind or body be prevented or removed. And here I wanna say, and I hope you will listen to me carefully, I recognize the troublesome appearance of this claim and the dreadful misuses to which it can be put. But think of the matter this way. If this claim were not true, human flourishing would be another monopoly of the wealthy Western industrialized countries, or at least the upper classes in them. Wealth can go a long way towards the prevention and amelioration of impediments to the thriving of mind and body through nutrition, medical care, education, and other such things that wealth makes possible. But wealth is neither necessary nor sufficient for human flourishing. And consequently, neither is the thriving of body or thriving of mind that help wealth helps to produce. And here I want to add hastily, but emphatically, that this claim should be no consolation for people who cause suffering to others or whose indifference contributes to it or who fail to remedy it when they can readily do so. That flourishing is compatible with suffering does not imply that such people aren't execrable in their conduct. It is hard not to notice that as the patristic thinkers regarded suffering, some diminishments in thriving of body or mind can in fact be woven into personal thriving. That is, the bodily or mental diminishments in thriving can in fact contribute to personal thriving, not because they constitute challenges that a person surmounts, but because those very diminishments are themselves ingredient in that person's thriving. The diminishments are integral to the personal thriving in the sense that their removal would constitute the removal or at least the lessening of the personal thriving. Harriet Tubman's suffering from the depredations of the slave society around her and her consequent impairments in both mind and body seem to be part of the fabric of her character marked by her charismatic leadership in her society and her self-sacrificial care for others. Or think of the same point the other way around. How many people who live an upper class life without much serious suffering, without much of any impairment in mind or body, how many of those people count as having great personal thriving? How many people in a life of ease with little tribulation in it seem to be an example of human flourishing that others would love to be like? On the contrary, greatness of personal thriving seems to be found largely, if not exclusively, among those who suffer greatly too. It is difficult to think of anyone who lacks such suffering and yet excites powerful admiration for the personal thriving in his life. That suffering can lead to great personal thriving seems to me overwhelmingly confirmed by evidence of all kinds, including historical reflection, psychological studies, and plausible fictional narratives. But why it should be so is harder to see. On the scale of value for flourishing, which is maintained in Orthodox Christian theology and which is widely held even by those who don't accept that theology, human flourishing has relationships of love at its heart. 
But the post-fall human condition is characterized by a tendency to turn away from such relationships into a kind of real loneliness and isolation. And so the post-fall human condition inclines a person in a direction that undermines flourishing when flourishing is understood as a matter of relationships of love. Suffering can make a difference to this condition in varying ways. In the first place, because suffering is generally aversive, it can drive a person to seek amelioration from the suffering. And that amelioration will have to be sought at least in part in the remedies other people can provide. Or if all remedies fail, then suffering can incline a person to seek just the consolation that other people can give by their presence and compassion. Even when suffering cannot be taken away or diminished, it can somehow be made more bearable by the consolation of the presence of loving others. Secondly, it has to be said that for those who suffer involuntarily and whose wills are therefore set against the suffering, suffering can be an affront to the ego. In saying this, I do not mean to imply that this reaction is blameworthy. On the contrary, there can be something pathological about passivity in the face of suffering. When to the great scandal of the comforters in his story, Job unleashes his furious protest to God for God's allowing his suffering, God himself says at the end of the story that only Job, not those pious comforters, but only Job has said what was right about God. So I don't mean to imply any negative assessment by saying that the mere fact of suffering can be an affront to the ego of the sufferer. I mean only to call attention to the fact that when a person cannot ward off from himself what his will is set against, he is driven to acknowledge that he is not sufficient for himself. In this spirit, he will also be more likely to be willing to seek help, human help, or God's help. For one reason or another, then suffering can break in on a person's inwardness and isolation. The aversiveness of suffering can fuel a person's willingness to seek connection with others. A suffering person may turn to other human beings, but it is also widely recognized that in suffering a person is likely to turn to God, even if this turning comes with anger or remonstrance, as it does in Job's case. It is common to find religious belief and religious experience among those in deep distress, it is less common to find true religiosity among those at ease. For Harriet Tubman, God was always present to her and engaged with her. One of her contemporary biographers describes an experience that was typical for her. It occurred at the time in her life when she was first contemplating returning to slave territory to rescue other slaves. The biographer says, Harriet had great fears about her future course, and she confided to me, the Lord told me to do this. And I said, oh, Lord, I can't. Don't ask me. Take somebody else. But Tubman also reported that God spoke directly to her. It's you I want, Harriet Tubman. As this and other anecdotes from Tubman's life illustrate, suffering is part of an ongoing process in a person's life in which flourishing can develop and increase. The correlation between suffering and flourishing depends on second personal relationships of love, and such relationships are dynamic, not static, even where God is concerned. It is part of traditional Christian theology that God will give grace to anyone who does not refuse it, but clearly a process of this sort will expand rapidly if it is continued. That is because the grace given enables a person to ameliorate her own inner fragmentation and so to be more willing to be open to love and goodness. And this increased openness on her part will be met with more grace that grows her in more goodness, thereby resulting in more grace given and so on. Seeing the relationship between God and a person in grace in this way explains the line in the gospels that to him who has more will be given. This is an odd distribution principle if one is thinking of goods that diminish when they are distributed such as money or human honor. But it's a distribution principle that makes sense if one is thinking of grace and love. Love grows in consequence of being accepted and shared. In so far as suffering opens a person to love and deepens her in closeness to God and others, it is an element in this growth. And that is why what makes Tubman exemplary for us increased in her throughout her life. So here's what I want to say in conclusion. 
I have no wish to support anything that would seem in any way to make light of Tubman's suffering. The suffering inflicted on her by the people promoting and maintaining slavery highlight the terribleness of the human post-fall disorder for which no words are negative enough. Nonetheless, with diffidence, I want to suggest that Tubman's life also illustrates well the complicated thought in 2 Corinthians with which I began and the traditional Christian attitude towards suffering represented by those lines from Chrysostom that I gave at the outset of this lecture. On the complex thought in the Pauline epistle, in virtue of suffering, a person can grow in flourishing, even with irremediable and significant impediments to the thriving of body or mind, until there is in her life such flourishing that it is right to think of it as glory. And to take the next part of the epistle thought, the affliction that a person suffers in this process will have a correlated consolation in the presence of God with her. Tubman's flourishing came to her in virtue of her suffering, and the result is that her life is an example of the best a human life can be. The connection that the epistle makes between suffering and glory is illustrated in her life. And so is the epistle's claim that consolation increases with affliction. That Harriet Tubman is as exceptional in her ongoing religious experience as in her great heartedness and her suffering, that's evident not only from her own testimony, but also the testimony of others who knew her. Her contemporary biographer summed the matter up this way. The biographer said, Harriet spoke of consulting with God and she trusted that he would keep her safe. Thomas Garrett once said of her, I never met with any person of any color who had more confidence in the voice of God spoken direct to her soul. This evaluation of Harriet Tubman's life is surely right. At any rate, it's highly doubtful whether any of those in the relatively well-to-do slaveholding communities around her lived in the kind of ongoing powerful religious experience she had. And so the epistle's correlation of glory and of consolation with suffering seems well illustrated in her life. On this way of thinking about suffering, it's not hard to see why Chrysostom would say that those who suffer more are those who are especially dear to God. Now here it's important for you to hear me. I am not claiming that the good of human flourishing justifies any human being in causing or permitting or failing to remedy suffering of the sort Harriet Tubman endured. To say that a person flourishes as she does at least in part in virtue of her suffering does not imply that it would be acceptable for another human being to permit it or to cause it or to refuse to remedy it if he could readily do so. It is one thing to claim that some suffering can lead to the flourishing of the sufferer and is another thing entirely to claim that a person is justified in causing or allowing such suffering on the part of another person for the sake of that flourishing. In addition, it's important to see that the consolation that increases with affliction, as the epistle says, that consolation may not come at the same time as the affliction. It may come only later. Even those who seem to lack all consolation because they are burdened by depression or something else that leaves them destitute of ordinary human peace, they may yet find that their suffering enables them to flourish later with greater peace and greater joy than others who have not experienced such desolation. Finally, someone may suppose that for every one person, such as Harriet McBride Johnson or Harriet Tubman, there are countless others who do not flourish in their suffering. But such a claim about the relative proportion of people who suffer without ever flourishing in consequence, that claim seems to me unsupported by any good evidence. Suffering is not always transparent even to the sufferer, let alone to those around the sufferer, and flourishing is similarly not transparent either. In this respect, consider Sophie Scholl. She was executed by the Nazis after a speedy show trial, and she was buried in an outcast grave at what was then the edge of Munich. Hardly anyone around the world then knew who she was or cared to know either, but now she is honored the whole world over for the flourishing of her life, and her grave is never without fresh roses. So it is possible for a person both to suffer and to flourish in ways invisible to others, at least for a time, at least in this life. 
Consequently, the claim that most sufferers find no flourishing in their suffering is not only unsupported, but in fact, it is such that empirical support for that claim is in principle hard to come by. With these caveats underlined then, it seems to me right to acknowledge that there is a connection between the flourishing of Harriet Tubman's life and the suffering she endured. It seems to me true to say with the thought of the epistle that she flourished in virtue of her suffering. If there is something heartbreakingly shaming about the whole human species in consequence of its part in such horrors as the slavery of the antebellum South, then the gloriousness of Tubman's life is highlighted by contrast. With all the impediments as regards mind and body which were suffering for her, who would not grant that the flourishing of her life greatly outranked that of the slaveholders whose lives had vastly less suffering than hers, or even greatly outranked the lives of the northerners who lived at ease and were content not to mingle themselves in the troubles of others? Who would pick one of those Southern slaveholders or those indifferent Northerners as exemplary of human flourishing? By contrast with the life of Harriet Tubman, their lives look sad or shaming for our species. And if like the slaveholding Southerners or the uninteresting, uninterested Northerners, Tubman had just lived a life of relative wealth and comfort, it seems unlikely that she would have become the woman we are now honored to honor. And so there is something deeply right in the traditional Christian attitude about suffering. A person is more than the sum of her mind and body. And there can be a magnificent flourishing of the whole person, not in spite of, but because of the suffering she endures. And with that, I am done. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor, for that uh, inspiring talk on personal flourishing. Uh, and its relationship to suffering. Uh, welcome now our, our panelists uh, to continue on in the conversation as well as you, the audience. Now is the time for your questions. Please use the, the Q&A function that's available on the bottom of the Zoom platform. And as your questions uh, start to come in, I'd like to just briefly introduce our panelists. For those of you visiting us for the first time, um, our panelists are also the speakers of our lecture series and they've all uh, kindly agreed to participate in each other's lectures throughout the year. Uh, so with us today, we have Chris Wright, who is the International Director of Langham Partnership International. Chris, thanks for raising your hand. Uh, we have Paul Nedaleski. You can raise your hand, Paul. Thank you. Assistant Director and Fellow of the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture. Christian Miller, A.C. Reed Professor of Philosophy at Wake Forest. Uh, Max Lee, Professor of New Testament at North Park, as well as Oliver O'Donovan, professor, a pre, former pre, professor of Christian ethics and practical theology at University of Edinburgh. Uh, as well, we also have with us today guest moderating Kevin Van Hooser, professor of theology here at Trinity. Uh, so again, Eleanor, welcome. Uh, thank you, and welcome to the panelists. And Kevin, uh, I'll hand the conversation over to you now. Very good. Well. Thank you, Eleanor, for a wonderful paper. Uh, in my opinion, an example of philosophy at its finest, uh, raising in terms that everyone can understand profound questions about the human condition and then offering a Christian way forward. Um, as one who wrote his doctoral dissertation on biblical narrative and the philosophy of Paul Ricoeur, I appreciate the role you give narrative in your own work. Uh, with regard to this paper, what I found particularly intriguing was this idea of a third mode of thriving. Uh, I think that's a welcome and tremendously important countercultural alternative to what I see as a present focus on wellness or trauma. Those seem to be the things that dominate the contemporary discussion. But uh, if I could start us off with a personal question that I can pose in the form of a brief narrative. Um, so several years ago, my mother was diagnosed with dementia. Uh, for several years, she lived with us until she fell and was unable to walk. And in the meantime, her glaucoma got to be so bad that she's virtually blind. So the blindness and the state of her constant confusion inclines me to describe her condition, to use your book title, as wandering in darkness, literally more so than magnificent flourishing. So my question is, 
is the third mode of thriving, personal thriving, open to someone in her condition? I would, I would say certainly it is. You want to remember, you want to remember um, what's, what's the best thing for us to be. So think about it this way. What are we? Start with that. What are we? And then we'll have a better idea of what it is, what it is to be perfect or to be the best we can be. What we are is made in the image of God. So all that is beautiful in us, all that is excellent in us, is the image of God. And as that image is intensified, we flourish. Now, um, if you want to know what the image is of something is, you've got to know what the original is. And the original is given for us by the biblical line, God is love. So insofar as a human life manifests insofar as a human life manifests the love of God, the, to that extent, it is the best it can be. The human being flourishes in that condition. And now you have to remember uh, what Christianity says. It says, greater love has no one than to lay down his life for his friends. The love of God is shown most powerfully in the passion of Christ, where he accepted his suffering for the love of God the Father and for the love of humanity. So insofar as a human being suffers in one way, the depredations of other people, the depredations of age or nature or whatever it might be, and nonetheless loves in return, um, you have there someone in whom the image of God is growing greater. And to that extent, that person is also flourishing. So I myself am familiar with uh, an old lady who through most of her life was something of an affliction to other folks. Uh, to those who knew her best, um, she, she was somebody you might wanna give a wide birth to. But in her very old age, she became demented and also uh, immobile. She, she you know, was wheelchair bound and so on. And, um, Whenever she left her family, she would just beam at them and say, I love you all so much. Although often enough, she didn't recognize the individual members of that family and would say, who is that? Nonetheless, she beamed with love and said, I love you so much. And that she was flourishing in that. You could see by her impact on the others. The children in that family mirrored that love back to her. And although she was a really unattractive old lady, they cared for her, they sang for her, they moved her wheelchair into the sunshine. You know, nothing I know about her life was as good as that part. So that's what I would say. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, give the panelists an opportunity to respond. And meanwhile, I'm keeping an eye on questions that are coming in from the audience. But first of all, panelists, uh, who would like to go first and respond? I have a question sort of following on your, your question, Kevin, if that's all right. Um, Eleanor, first of all, thank you for this great paper. Um, when I first read it, I disliked it very much. Uh, but I read it again, and I realized that was because you were changing my mind. And you know, it's just, it's the old ego. Well, if it's not my thought, it must be wrong. And then I realized, no, that these are actually good arguments. And this is very profound. So I think it's a very good paper. And it's challenged me in all the best ways. Um, part of my only like residual tension or, or dissatisfaction is that it, uh, your account really shakes up, I think some traditional ways of thinking about um, the role that flourishing is thought to play. You know, I think in, at least in some parts of the Christian tradition, we would say uh, flourishing maybe is something we can approximate in this life. Um, but ultimately it will be found in the New Jerusalem, at the, you know, the restoration of all things, the overcoming of the, the consequences of sin. Um, it's harder to understand uh, flourishing in those ways on your account, it seems to me, or maybe I'm just not putting the pieces together correctly because uh, you know, you're, you're arguing in the paper in part that the people who most flourish are those who are most suffering. Um, and you, you want to describe someone like Harriet Tubman, you know, not just in sort of retrospect, looking back on her heroic deeds of righteousness, but even while she's doing them, while she's in the agony of, 
of these righteous actions. You, you want to say she is flourishing. It's harder to understand flourishing in these traditional ways as sort of a restoration of what is broken in the created order. Or so, so it seems to me. So I wondered if you could comment on that and adjust as necessary my understanding. Okay, so I think that's a lovely question. And, and I think the thing that worries you is a really good thing to think about, to think about hard. So um, you might try thinking about it with, with regard to the passion of Christ and see if that helps. So if the end of the story were Christ is crucified on the cross in the agony of that slow death by torture, and that's going to be his condition for the rest of his life, and that's what we call flourishing, well, that would be a pretty weird story. It would certainly not be a story I want to support. So what you have to understand is um, the suffering of Christ on the cross is not the ideal condition for Christ. And, and physical suffering for human beings is not the ideal condition for human beings. Nonetheless, nonetheless, what is the representation of Christ that we have? that we, we look to, that is meaningful to us, the most meaningful of all to us, it's Christ on the cross. And when he's resurrected, he maintains the wounds of the crucifixion, and why? I mean, wouldn't wounds be disfiguring? I mean, would you like to have a big gaping hole in your side? And the answer is they don't disfigure him. They are, they are images of his glory because on the cross, he was glorious. So how are, we, how are we to understand this? Well, um, you want to distinguish between in this life and in the afterlife. So we don't expect in the afterlife that Christ will have a bunch more crucifixions because that's so glorious for him. The crucifixion is once for all. And that is the story to be told about every human life. And it goes sort of like this. I mean, think about it, think about it with respect to Peter. So um, how do you feel about Peter? Well, you know, how do you feel about your own worst sins? They're not as bad as Peter's. You at any rate did not betray Christ in his hour of need. Whatever you did that was disgusting that you don't want me to know about, it's not as bad as that. Furthermore, we are 2000 years downstream from Peter's sin and we all still know it. That sin is attached to Peter's life like a tail that he cannot get rid of. Why, why is this okay? I mean, why doesn't this completely wreck Peter's life in the afterlife? And the answer is that these things that deface our life here or that deface our bodies here or our psyches here, these things are part of the glory of our life in the afterlife also, just as Christ's wounds are part of the glory of his life but they don't retain their power to hurt us. And if you can't figure out how that could possibly be true, think about parents of young children. So um, if we weren't here in a public session, I get started telling you stories about my first one when he was two years old, and I could keep that up a long time. He was the Tyrannosaurus Rex of two years old, and you can't believe the trouble that kid made. And now I love to tell those stories and they make me laugh, but trust me, when he was two, my husband and I got a babysitter, drove about a block away from home, stopped at a stoplight and were too tired to go when the light turned green. My husband said to me, if he becomes a criminal when he grows up, it's not our fault. <laughs> we weren't laughing then. We weren't laughing then, but we laugh now because now those bad times are encompassed in a narrative of love and flourishing that we cause. And that's how it is for Peter. That's how it is for Christ and his wounds. And that is why you get this sort of bifurcated story where you don't have the suffering in the afterlife, but you have the marks of it remaining without causing pain. But the marks of it are, are part of the glory of the flourishing in the afterlife too. So that's the complicated story. Something like that is the answer to your question. Thank you. Chris Wright has a question for you. Yes, uh, thank you again. Thank you, Eleanor, for that, uh, that, that paper and the lecture. I'm wondering whether uh, you would wish to comment any further on the Old Testament. You obviously started with New Testament references, and you did quote from Job, of course. Um, 
but it seems to me that there would be fruitful thinking in relation to a number of areas that I, I'm just coming to mind. One is, for example, what is the relationship between flourishing as our word and let's say Old Testament words like blessing, uh, the, the, the Barak uh, concept or Shalom, uh, which in the Old Testament seems to include God's blessing of fruitfulness and abundance and wholeness and health. Um, such that, for example, when the sacrificial system, it's, it's an unblemished lamb that must be offered and the priests must be also whole without uh, physical impairment or, or, or whatever. So there's that side. And yet, equally within the Old Testament law, there is the whole element of compassion for, uh, for the disabled. There, there are laws relating to uh, not uh, acting wrongly to the blind or the deaf. Uh, there's the possibility that Moses had a speech impediment, that, that's one way of interpreting what he says, that he, he can't speak. We don't know, of course, exactly what that was. But there's certainly this element of compassion. And then the eschatological vision that, uh, in, uh, that, that God would bring about when God comes, then uh, the lame will leap for joy, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, and so on. Uh, so there's that sense of something will come in the future, which is in no way regarded as somehow um, disrespectful to those who are suffering uh, a disability or whatever it may be in the present. So some of those reflections from an Old Testament angle would be interesting to me as to how you might uh, unpack them or possibly relate them through to the fulfillment of those hopes in Jesus, of course, and his ministry of healing. And then, of course, uh, the cross. Well, that's a fairly big suitcase of a question. <laughs> it, it is. I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, I'm going to interpret it in a certain way. And then if I don't really get to the thing that was really on your mind, then you should ask it again. But I hear you saying something like this, or this is how I'm interpreting what I hear you saying anyway. What about, what about Jews? I mean, this is a very Christian idea I'm putting forward. What about Jews? Now, the first thing I want to say is uh, I have no license for Jewish philosophy or uh, Hebrew scriptures. I have, no, I have no professional license. Nonetheless, uh, I do have Abner competence for sure. And um, Jews like Christians don't speak with one voice. So if you look at Sadia Gaon's commentary on Job, uh, it looks in many respects indistinguishable from the way Christians want to read that story. Where it is distinguished from the commentary on Job by somebody like Aquinas, it's only insofar as Sadia focuses more on communal suffering, Aquinas more on individual suffering. But apart from that difference in emphasis, they see this story in exactly the same way. And really, you know, what do I want to say? Job suffers worse than anybody in the Hebrew scriptures. And he also is more glorious than anybody else either because Nobody, including Father Abraham, nobody in the Hebrew scriptures gets as long a conversation with God as he does. And nobody except him can say, now my own eye sees you. So, so Sadia and uh, Aquinas seems to me take the same lesson from that story. And it's the lesson that I was just telling right now. So, but, but of course, if you go to Moses Maimonides, if you go to Maimonides, uh, Maimonides just really hates Sadia's interpretation. Uh, he doesn't cite Sadia by name exactly, but he but he describes Sadia's position, and he thinks it's either it's either morally wrong or idiotic or both. I mean, he really really hates it. Uh, and um, what do I want to say? You can you can see, of course, analogous divergences and splits within the Christian tradition. Christian tradition doesn't speak with one voice either. So, um, but, but at any rate, for the line I was presenting that comes out of the patristic period, the Christian line coming out of the patristic period and well represented all the way through the high middle ages at any rate as the main line, that is also a main line within Judaism. So Sadia Gaon, who is endearing in his naivete, he says, I don't know any person among our people who wouldn't find this exactly right. Of course, you know, he didn't know Maimonides. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> but that's what I want to say in answer to your question. Thank you. Yeah. Let me uh, voice a question that's come from the audience and several people have resonated with it. Here's the question. Uh, justified that, or sorry, granted that we're um, not justified in enabling the suffering of others, should we actively seek our own suffering to provide us opportunities to flourish? Well, I love that question to all the people who raised it. I think that's an excellent question. Um, and certainly in the history of the Christian tradition, people thought the answer to that question is, oh yes, for sure. Let's hurry and get as much suffering as possible. But um, the main mainstream of Christian thought has, has given an answer of no to that question. And um, the reason for the no seems to me to be pretty clear. Think about it this way. Suppose I learn that poisonous chemicals can make you healthy. That's what chemotherapy is. It's poisonous, poisonous chemicals. You give these poisonous chemicals to somebody and they live longer. And so now I have a great idea. I'll have poisonous chemicals too. I'll see if I can get my hands on them and I'll eat them. And everybody will think, oh, stop that woman. The, the, the problem is that poisonous chemicals can be administered appropriately, intelligently, beneficially, only by a person who's medically competent and who knows the innermost biochemistry of me. I do not know the inner biochemistry of me. I don't have a license to know the inner biochemistry of me. And I'm hardly, hardly qualified to administer poisonous chemicals in a beneficial way to anybody, let alone to myself. And that is what suffering is. It's a poisonous chemical, but it's a poisonous chemical that can bring about flourishing if it's used by somebody who knows the innermost heart of the sufferer and can administer it intelligently, deftly, and beneficially. And that person is only God, that's not us. And therefore our job is to do what we can to avoid suffering, but when it comes to us involuntarily, to see if we can turn it to excellent use. Thank you. Uh, Max, you have a question. Yes, um, I, I just wanna say that um, what a, I thought your paper was um, amazing. Uh, best paper I read this year, uh, especially in a year of profound suffering during a pandemic. Uh, I found your paper not only timely, but it's content enduring. So I wanna thank you for that. I thought your insights into the reading of 2 Corinthians 1, 5, 3, 18, 4, 17 was very helpful. And I, what I, the question I wanted to ask was actually related to the question that you just answered. Um, the question is about a missing frame. And I think that'll answer some of the questions that the panelists has asked as well. Um, the context of 2 Corinthians 1 through 5 is actually, I think, the ministry of Paul. Um, he says that the, it's when he does, in the midst of suffering, he see, according to your paper, he receives the commensurate amount of God's consolation. And then with that commensurate amount of God's consolation, he doesn't just keep it to himself, but he actually seeks to console others. And if you can seek to consult others, I think everyone who's tuning in that's a pastor or someone who serves in the church knows that ministry means suffering. Uh, there's no way you can engage in the lives of others without experiencing suffering of some sort. So what I wanted to say was that there is an immediate context to Second Corinthians that I think upon theological reflection can be applied to other situations. And the situation that you um, named was the was um, when suffering is permanent in this earthly life, when people struggle with mental and body impediments. And I don't want to defer um, the profound theological reflection that allows us to apply this text to that context. But I, I do want to say that maybe perhaps the, the missing frame is that as the church is charged to go out into the world, the world is broken and fallen, and we experience kinds of suffering that might not be permanent, but they become opportunities to experience God's consolation and in which we turn, we pay that forward. And I just wanted to know if, um, you're just, if your thoughts on the issue of suffering and flourishing, that, that 
a component of flourishing is actually um, uh, this uh, includes this frame of of Paul's immediate ministerial context. That that's actually let's say the space in which f flourishing can take place, but not not the only space. Did you consider that as part of your reflections on the on the relationship between suffering and 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 uh, human flourishing? Well, I'm not sure I'm going to get your question right. So if okay, I haven't got okay. it right, I'd like you to ask it again. But um, mm -hmm. but I hear you saying something. I mean, I hear two questions mingled together. One question I hear goes something like this. Um, look, don't we need to go out and engage in ministry so that we'll suffer? I mean, if we don't, if we just stay home and don't engage in ministry, we won't suffer. So people who think, gosh, I'm a person at ease. I don't suffer, so I don't flourish. Oh, poor me. That person's just mixed up because that person can always go out and engage in ministry and then that person will suffer. So if that's your question, then my answer is, yeah, that's, that's right. If you're worried about not having enough suffering for flourishing, you're just not paying attention to the world around you. There's need everywhere. And if you respond to the need, whatever it might be, whatever it might be, if, if um, you know, I have a friend who loves horses. So I don't do popular culture and I don't know anything about sports or any other part of popular culture either, but my friend does. And my friend showed me a video clip of this very famous horse secretariat when that horse won the triple crown at the Belmont. And according to my friend, horses win races by a nose or maybe by a head or something. And secretariat won his race at the Belmont by 33 lengths, an achievement never heard of before and never heard of since. And the jockey on the horse said, I don't know what to tell you. He said, I don't know what to tell you. All I can say is that day, God spoke to the horse and the horse listened. And my friend showed me this because he said, this is what we are all called to do, live our lives like Secretariat at the Belmont. And that was a beautiful, a beautiful image. But if you are willing to live your life like Secretariat at the Belmont, you're going to have no problem about getting sufficient suffering for tons of flourishing. That's for sure. So, so that's one thing I heard your, your question asking. And the other thing I heard your question asking was something like this. Um, look, isn't, isn't really the flourishing side of suffering, it's usefulness. Isn't it its usefulness? And there, um, I want to demur. So I belong to the Protestant culture of this country like everybody else. And I think usefulness is one of the best things there is. You know, what use is it? You're not being useful. I mean, all these the emphasis on usefulness comes really, I would say, out of the Puritan tradition. And I've, I feel it too. But as um, Kevin's example of his love family member shows, you can be beautiful when you can't be useful. You can flourish when you can't be useful anymore. Because simply in yourself, you receive the love of God and you mirror it back so others are blessed in its image. And that's, um, I mean, if you want to call that useful, that's a pretty weird understanding of usefulness. The, the, um, the person who's utterly isolated through disease or dementia or something else, person who's utterly isolated and unable to get out in the world, that person can still flourish in beauty because in the end, what makes you beautiful is the image of God in you and God is love. Thank you. You did. I mean, I agree. I, and, and I and um, I I just want to make sure Conk is under there's a lot of questions, but uh, you also answered indirectly my question about ingredient versus instrumental uses of suffering. And I and so that suffering is an ingredient. I thought that was a profound choice of words and that you shied away from accidental or, or instrumental uses of suffering. So thank you for, for bringing that out. And thank you for bringing out your your language of defining glory as spiritual um, a beauty, a splendor of some sort. I forget the exact words that you use, but um, that that um, a person, even in their non-usefulness, can reflect back God's glory. And, and that's a sign for human flourishing. Thank, thank you for also bringing that out as well in, in your response. So I'll just stop here.
I have another question that a number of the audience members would like you to answer. Here's the question. One of the tragedies of suffering, both physical and mental, is its isolating power, uh, cutting us off from the second person relationships of personal thriving. How can you integrate this aspect of suffering into your account? It is for sure true that suffering will isolate. For sure it is. Um, you know, if, if you want to see it, um, if you want to see it real clearly, you can look at Lamaze manuals for childbirth. So um, childbirth is painful. And um, the idea is it'll be more successful or easier or something, something good will happen if there's a labor coach with any luck, the father of the baby. And what the manuals say to the father is, look, you may be right there, but she's not going to pay any attention to you. She may not even know you're there. What you have to do is you have to get right down in her face. Let her have your face right next to her. Let her feel your breathing on her cheek. So that's, that's an example of the isolation of pain par excellence. If you've got to you know, get your face right into somebody else's face for them to notice that you're there, that's, that's real isolation produced by pain. But um, what do I want to say? Childbirth shows you the answer to the question too. So there are women who choose natural childbirth and whose first experience of natural childbirth is really painful. And you'd think that they would say, okay, that is it for me for the next baby. I'm having a spinal block, okay. But actually they choose natural childbirth again. And not just because um, there's something about pain they like, there's something about pain they don't like, but what they value is the way in which they are bonded together with the baby and with the labor coach or the father of the baby. They're bonded with the adult and the baby through the very experience of pain that left them so isolated in the middle of it. So although there is something isolating in the pain itself, it has a way of opening people up to others deeply in psyche. Um, so, so that afterwards, not in the very moment in which it isolates, but afterwards, the whole experience is greatly prized. I think, um, I think there's hardly anybody who has been through a natural childbirth as a coach or as, um, as a, as a mother-to-be. There's hardly anybody who's participated in that who doesn't understand this point. There is a power of bonding through an experience which at some points in the middle of the experience isolates. The isolation is wrapped up in a bonding of love. And if there is no other human, I mean, I think, for example, of Natan Sharansky, the great Jewish hero who was, um, who was imprisoned in the gulag for a long time. He was in horrible conditions in the gulag. He was very isolated in the gulag, very isolated in solitary confinement for a long time. But he said the Psalms, he said the Psalms. He remembered the woman he loved and he remembered the God he loved. And he was not alone in solitary confinement in that sense. Uh, may I ask the panelists who haven't spoken? Christian, please. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Brilliant paper, just just, uh, just amazed as always by your work. Um, two things. First, a um, possible just terminological suggestion, see what you think of it, and then a clarification question. So the terminological suggestion is, for the third kind of thriving, you were saying you weren't sure what label to use. It seemed to me it had a lot to do with character. Um, maybe that's because I work on character. So I'm kind of seeing it through that lens, uh, especially moral character. So I was wondering if you would be okay with calling it uh, instead of more, in addition to personal thriving, a matter of characterological thriving or, or thriving one's character. Um, so that's the first thing, just a question about the scope of the thriving maybe extends beyond character, but is that the central aspect of it? Uh, Chris, the, Chris, could I yeah. take your questions one by one? Oh, sure, 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 absolutely, sorry. Okay, so um, I do appreciate your point. 
And for sure, I think character is something very important for us to focus on, something very important in the Christian life. For sure and certain, I do. Um, but equally for sure and certain is not what I want here. And you can think about it this way. Um, character is something you have inside yourself. It's an intrinsic characteristic of an individual human being. But everything I'm most interested in is the opposite of that. It's relational. It's something you couldn't have by yourself in isolation. The heart of human flourishing is a condition in which you say, my beloved is mine and I am his. And you cannot have that condition in isolation. That's the point. So, yeah. yeah. Well, we could talk more about that, but I, I know there's a lot of questions too in the queue. So uh, just the other point real quickly, uh, just clarification about what something you said at the end of the paper about whether your line of reasoning would justify human beings in causing suffering and others for the sake of promoting this third kind of thriving. And you said, no. Uh, and then when you had the, during the Q and A, you also talked about whether we'd be justified in causing suffering to ourselves for the sake of our own thriving. And you said, no. Um, a lot of that had to do with epistemic limitations. Um, we just wouldn't know uh, exactly how to go about doing that. Um, you use the analogy with the doctor. Um, what about in the case of God? Uh, so God doesn't have those epistemic limitations. Um, on your view, does God actually cause suffering for the sake of bringing about this third kind of thriving? And if so, would God be, be justified in doing so? This is, this is not an objection, this is clarification. What, what, uh -huh. what follows from your view here with respect to God? Well, you know, I have loved all these questions, but that's my favorite one so far for sure. It's an impossibly tricky and difficult question. And um, you can see, you can see the power of the question and the difficulty of it, if you remember that Christians are committed to what is often called the Felix culpa view. So, um, you, so, so I don't want to take forever at answering this, but it's just a wonderful question. So, so remember that when God finished His creation, He looked at it and He said, "Wow! Oh my gosh." That's so good. And the angels, when they saw it, shouted for joy and sang. Then we had the Holocaust, slavery, the destruction of the earth, the endless depredations against the, the weak and the vulnerable, the, the tragedy of the children, the cruelty to the beasts. At some point in there, you're thinking to yourself, oh, I see what Christianity is saying. Christianity is saying there is an omniscient, omnipotent, perfectly good, really disappointed God, because look what it was in the beginning and look at what he's got now. Plan B with a vengeance. And the Christian tradition in the face of that says, no, Felix culpa. Now, the thing to understand about the Felix culpa view is that it's not giving a theodicy. It's presupposing a successful theodicy. Suppose there's a successful theodicy. God's justified in having allowed it to go like this. It also presupposes, the Felix Culpa view also presupposes a successful, acceptable interpretation of the doctrine of the opponent. And God can fix it. Don't worry, it won't always be like this. And that still leaves you with the complete paradox of the Felix Culpa view. How do you want me to understand that God thinks this was an okay way to go because he may be justified in allowing this. Maybe he can fix it in the end, but in the middle, look what happened to what made the angels sing. Nobody's singing over that mess. See what I mean? And the Felix Culpa view says, yes, they are. Yes, they are. It's better that way. It's better that way. And how to figure out how to, in the Felix Culpa view, is, is embedded in the Christian scriptures. It's a strong and powerful thread all the way through the Christian tradition. And, and the question is, um, how is anybody going to answer Christian's question about whether it was okay for God to allow that? See what I mean? That's not a question. The answer is not a theodicy. The question presupposes one. The answer is, even if we had a successful theodicy, what are we supposed to think about this, this view of God? 
not disappointed by this mess, but somehow glorious in it. Why would that be? And that, that takes a lot of talking. Explaining that takes a lot of talking. Several in the audience have asked or voted for this particular question. Um, given that suffering may be coming our way, what virtues or characteristics should we be seeking to form in order to prepare ourselves for its reality, what it does hit? Um, that is a lovely question. And I like very much the people who raised it. It's a sweet question. But it's also just, just listen to my words and look at my face. It's a heretical question. And do you know why? because it suggests you can work your way into a good state. Think about it for a minute. Think about it. What does Paul say? There is nothing good in you that you have not received. So um, if you try to figure out what you can do to get yourself in a condition so that you'll do well when suffering comes, you got a Pelagian idea. It doesn't work like that. Think Alcoholics Anonymous and you'll have a much better idea. What does Alcoholics Anonymous say? First, you have to crash. Why do you have to crash? Because you have to acknowledge that you've got big problems and you cannot handle them by yourself. That's the first move. And the second move is to be open to a higher power and let that power work in you. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous says. And that is, that is what do I want to say? That is, in my view, the basic Christian understanding of all of us. All of us need to crash and all of us need to recognize we have major problems and we cannot handle them by ourselves. But what we can do is be, is be in a position of surrender so that the love of God can work in our lives. And you might think to yourself, okay, fine. So I surrendered and guess what? Nothing happened, nothing happened. It's still just me. But, but that's to misunderstand how it works also. So the way we surrender is, is the way Augustine prayed to God for celibacy. Here's how Augustine prayed to God for celibacy. Dear God, I have to have celibacy. I want it. You're not giving it. I want it. I need it. I really have to have it, but not today. Tomorrow would be better. Today I have a headache. I just don't feel well. And, and that's the way we surrender too. We say, okay, I'm, I'm open to your grace. Except, of course, for those places in my life where I'm holding as tight as I can to the sinful things I want more than I want your grace. And so, and so um, you can think about the way God works on analogy with a theory about Band-Aids. There are two different camps of theories about Band-Aids. One camp says, rip it off. Just rip it off. It hurts less if you rip it off. And the other camp says, no, 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 that's terrible. Peel it very slowly. If you are in the camp of the rippers, then you may be like Paul on the road to Damascus. Just have the mess ripped off in one amazing experience. But if you are in the much larger camp of the peelers, your surrender will be kind of a one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back sort of approach to the whole thing. So in answer to the question wants, to, the question is a beautiful question, a sweet question. It says, what should we do? What should we do? And the answer is, um, remember what the biblical text says, how beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news. Hold on to the feet of the guy who's bringing the good news. Just hold on to the feet and let's see what he can help you do. Something like that. I hope that's a sensible, I hope that's a sensible response. Thank you. Um, I, I want to make sure I give time to Oliver to ask a question. Are you willing to do so? Yes, indeed. Um, I, many of Eleanor's answers have underlined and reinforced for me what I thought was the real strength of her presentation, which was her determination to get um, the very flat account of flourishing and well-being with which commonly we work to get it moving historically and to remind us that there is a before and after uh, and that um, dynamic uh, development in time is actually a part of what it is to be to have welfare as a human being and I 
deeply appreciate that. Um, and Eleanor, I wanted to ask you on the strength of that, whether it commits you to an eschatology that is rather more than emerged in your paper, um, right back in the sixth century BC, Solon of Athens said to King Croesus, call no man happy until he's dead. That is, there's a point of view from which you can sum up where a life has gone, and it's not until then. Um, do we need, in order to adopt your notion of flourishing, uh, do we need a conviction that the righteous shall shine forth like the sun in their heavenly father's realm? Is that part of it? Uh, that in the end, our happiness is known to us because it is known to God and revealed by God, ultimately. And if that is so, is, ought we also to be talking about a form of flourishing that is not just the flourishing of the person, the individual, but is also right from the ground up um, a communal flourishing, not simply that as individuals, we flourish only in relation to other people. Yes, I, you've said that very clearly, I think, and it's right. Um, but that we flourish also only as communities and that the emergence of the kingdom of God has to be the emergence of the people of God, uh, a flourishing whole and not just flourishing parts. Could you respond to that, Eleanor? There's so many things in that question, Oliver, and they're all just so interesting. It's just a real temptation to me to know where to start. So one part of your question was um, not epistemological, but metaphysical, it was metaphysical. Um, do we need an afterlife? Does there have to be an afterlife for any of this theory to make sense? And, um, The answer to that is clearly sure, sure. I mean, that's part of the Pauline epistles. If there is no afterlife, we are among the most wretched of men, right? That seems, that seems totally right. I mean, if what you've got is something intrinsically bad, like the things that produce suffering, is after all to be valued, it's gotta be valued because of its instrumental character. You know, it can't be that we've decided, oh wait, oh wait, the intrinsically bad stuff is really the intrinsically good stuff. I mean, so so with apologies, I really like Oliver's question and I know I'm gonna go on too long, but consider what Francis of Assisi said about true joy. He was asked, Francis, what's true joy? And he said, true joy, ah, true joy. True joy is when you've been walking in the cold all day, you're half frozen, you fell through the ice in some pond, your habit got wet and the brambles, made your legs bleed and you haven't eaten anything in forever and you're so lonely and you're so wretched and there in the distance is a franciscan house and you think oh if i could just get there a warm dry habit a fire something to eat the company of the brothers it would be just so wonderful and you finally get there and you knock on the door and the porter says who's that and you say i'm francis the founder of your order and the porter says, Francis, that sinner? No way are you coming in. And he slams the door in your face. That's true joy. Now, you got to think about this one for a minute. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's Francis for you. And, and what you can see is that if we don't handle this story of true joy with care, we're going to get not that human beings flourish through their suffering with consolation in Christ. What we're going to get is just plain old masochism. So you mean... You have to be very careful. <laughs> and one of the things that keeps a story like Francis is about true joy from being um, really just toxic, what keeps it from that is precisely a sense of an afterlife. That's, it's, um, it is exactly as it says in the book of Daniel, they'll shine like stars in, in, in the heavens. They'll shine in the afterlife, they'll shine. And that, that uh, eschatological shining um, is what helps us understand that the attitude towards suffering of Francis in the story about true joy 
that's that um, that attitude towards suffering is not just a masochistic turning of all good things in life upside down because because of the docking effect. So for sure. Um, the other thing you asked was a, epistemological. I count no man happy till he's dead. It, what are we to say about that? And I would say, um, I would say there's two ways to understand that question from a Christian point of view. You could say, um, Oliver is asking, do you have to have this position? Count no man saved till he's dead. Um, and there I would say the answer is no. That's wrong. That's the wrong attitude. Consider the opposite side. Count no man damned till he's dead. And there I would say the answer is yes. Um, I mean, while a person lives, whatever condition that person is in, there's still a chance for a deathbed repentance on Christian doctrine. Dante has a guy in um, heaven who died suddenly on the field of battle and was a notorious sinner. And Dante, the traveler, says to him, what are you doing here? And the soul says, yeah, yeah, I died suddenly on the field of battle and I was a great sinner. And the devil came from my soul. But as I was dying, I shed a tear in my heart for my sins. And God's angel came to get me. And the devil said, wait a minute, for one tear? And God's angels said, God will take him any way he can get him. So, so that's the answer to the question, count no man damned till he's dead. As long as you could still squeeze out one tear in the process of dying, you, you might not be damned. That's the idea. But the part about saved is different. So um, you can think about the issue about judging whether you're saved or not. You can think about that on, on analogy with questions about a marriage. So it's been a long time since I looked. But the last time I looked, a long time ago, the statistics on marriage were something like this. 50% um, of all marriages fail. Doesn't matter if you're religious or not religious or what age you are and so on, 50% of marriages fail. So suppose you ask me, um, what, what do you think the chances are that your marriage will fail? If I say, well, 50%, what we know is my marriage is in trouble. That is the wrong answer. That's the wrong answer. <laughs> the right answer is no chance at all. Why? Am I being presumptuous at how terrific I am at being a wife? No, I'm not being presumptuous. I am, I am expressing a commitment in the fidelity of my spouse to this relationship and my own fidelity to it as well. That's the sense in which you have, uh, you have a commitment, a, a Christian commitment to answer the question, do you think you're saved? Of course. Of course I do. My beloved is mine and I am his. So that's why that second question is about the epistemological condition, Oliver, divides into two. Depends on whether the judgment has to do with the damnation of somebody or whether it has to do with your own salvation. Could I follow up just really quickly with Oliver's question? So maybe to say Oliver's the first part differently. If so, I, I, to be honest, your response rendered me a little bit confused because I thought you um, put via V each other an instrumental use of suffering and, and, and the use of the term ingredient. But it sounds more because this was based on your footnote uh, 15 in your paper. But um, if suffering does have an instrumental use, then what happens when the ingredient is gone? So we, at the resurrection, suffering is distinguished. And so I guess what does human flourishing look like in that context? And I'm, I'm just wondering if it has to do with the fact that you gave two profound examples of people in suffering and they talked with God, Harriet Tubman, and then also the patient of the, um, the, the I think it was Alston that you quoted, the book from Alston. Mm -hmm. And it's in the context of that conversation with God that they experienced flourishing and consolation. So could you just describe to me the mechanism of, of, of flourishing uh, with suffering? And then what does it mean when that, that ingredient is gone per, per Oliver Donovan's uh, question um, at the resurrection? Mm 
Um, it's a great question, and I'm I'm worried I'm going to take forever at it, or that I'm not going to hear it right because I'm so interested in it. So see, um, think about it like this: What does it mean for suffering to be gone? I mean, think back over something in your own life that you are really, really glad the rest of us don't know. Not only is that, and you might think to yourself, and thank goodness that is over. That's in the past, it's over. But it, it isn't over and it will never be over. It attaches to you forever. It's, it's part of, it's the tail. It's the ugly tail on the beauty of the thing you hope you will be in heaven. In heaven, not only will this not be gone, but we will all see it. We don't know what it is now, but in heaven, we'll all see it. None of it will be hidden. And now you might think to yourself, well, if everybody's going to see that, I don't know if I want to be in heaven. I mean, that is pretty, as a pretty awful fate. I don't see how it could be heaven if everybody's going to see that. And the answer is what I said before when I was talking about the wounds of Christ. The suffering remains ingredient in the flourishing, not qua painful, but qua suffering, if that makes any sense. That is, um, if, you, if, if you think back, as I was telling the story about the two-year-old, the really Tyrannosaurus Rex two-year-old in my house, if you think back on stories like that, you can see that there comes a point in life where they lose their power to hurt you. They don't lose their character as suffering. I would never say, oh, we had such a wonderful time when that child was two. It remains suffering, and that suffering remains part of my story, but it loses its pain, its ability to pain me. So a way to, a way to think about this distinction is to notice that um, it's to notice that the quality, think of it in terms of memory. The memory has an emotional coloring, but that emotional coloring is an emergent characteristic of the memory that arises when the memory interacts with the character of the person doing the remembering. So when I was an undergraduate, there was a, a blind boy in one of the men's dorms and the men in that dorm played a really horrible prank on that blind boy. I won't tell you what it is, it's unspeakably awful. It's unspeakably cruel. And the blind boy suffered. And the boys playing the prank thought it was very funny. So when they remembered it the next day, they were laughing. But I feel relatively confident that by the time those boys were moving into their middle age, when they remember that story, they remembered it with great pain, just with great pain. I don't see how you could remember having done a thing like that and not have great pain. So what, an episode in your life has in it for you, the emotional coloring has in it for you, is a function of the interaction between you and what that was. So the thing that was maximally painful for you can stay in your life, like Peter's treachery against Christ. It can lose its ability to hurt you. It stays as suffering, but it loses its ability to hurt qua suffering, something like that. We are running out of time, but we have several people who have questions. Are you willing to ask or answer one or two more? Sure. All right, uh, here's one. Uh, if human agents are not justified in permitting evil for the sake of some flourishing, why is God's goodness compatible with permitting such suffering for these purposes? Well, I didn't say it's never permissible for humans to, to um, bring about suffering for some good. So when you say to the two-year-old, Johnny, if you hit your sister one more time and throw your pizza on the floor one more time, you're going to have no dinner and you're going to your room and the little critter hits his sister and throws his pizza on the floor and you remove him from dinner and put him in his room, you have caused suffering so that good might come for the malefactor and you are justified in what you did. So, so sometimes we can um, be justified in causing suffering. Those are cases where we have a high degree of confidence that we know what we're doing in administering the suffering. Um, but, you know, when we're not in circumstances like sending the two-year-old to his room, when it's something having to do with the deep mysteries of the human heart, in, I mean, then we are out of our depth. 
And it's okay for God to use suffering in that way because God has got omniscience and the ability to see deeply into human hearts so that he can see which of the, uh, of the things that he might allow by way of suffering will be destructive and which have a very good chance of contributing to flourishing. Just as we can see, just as we can see in the case of those we punish or don't punish, we, we can see what is likely to succeed. So there was a point at which, um, there was a point at which one of my sons flew out of the house in a teenage rage to go to high school, but he wasn't out of the house for very long. There was a, just a terrible, terrible sound. And the terrible sound was followed by his coming back into the house. And he said, I didn't notice that dad's car was behind yours. So when I drove out of the garage, I crashed both the cars and neither one of them can drive. And I'm going to bed now. Wake me when it's Christmas because I'm not coming out of my room till then. <laughs> and, and I laughed. I sat on the floor and laughed. I did not see the point of punishing a person who felt he had to go to his room and stay there till Christmas. I mean, that person is already severely repentant. But in the case of the two-year-old, I was uh, fairly sure I was looking at a very non-repentant human being for whom punishment might be efficacious. So in some of these cases, we can tell, as I say, but in other cases, it takes God's omniscience to tell. And then we count on his goodness to guide his use of the power of suffering for the benefit of the sufferer. Good. This final question follows from what you've just said. It has two parts. So I'll, I'll give you the premise first. Given that God's ability to use suffering for good ends does not make that suffering a good in itself, that's the premise. The first part of the question is, what do you make of Marilyn Adams' contention that the ultimate use of suffering in achieving a grand good via creation requires universalism? Well, um, so I'm a little bit, I'm just a little bit hesitant because of course Marilyn is not with us anymore. And she was somebody who was part of my life story for decades. And so um, I want to be quite sure, you know, in my world, we say the most important things in Latin. That's what my daughter says. Uh, Nihil nisi bonum de mortuis. You want to say only good things about those who are not with us anymore. But um, she and I radically disagreed uh, on the distinction. On the, uh, we disagreed uh, about universalism. And what you have to understand is that what the disagreement comes to is a disagreement about the nature of love. That's a disagreement. So um, you can think about that disagreement this way. Um, who loves you the most? The person who will in the end get his way with regard to you but never be vulnerable to you? Or is it the person who will be vulnerable to you and let you have some say in what you're going to be? And uh, for my money, the person who loves you the most is the person who will let himself be vulnerable to you. And he will let you have some say in what's going to happen to you. See, if God loves everybody, that's the biblical line. God loves everybody. And here's what you know about God on the doctrine of hell. God has things he wants that he doesn't get. Right? He has things he wants he doesn't get. He wants you. And if you reject him, he doesn't get you. On this way of seeing things, God makes himself radically vulnerable to you. And in doing that, in doing that, he desires the good for you. The good for you is to be like him, able to choose things for yourself. And if you, if you are tempted by Marilyn's line, if you're tempted by that universal, then you should go have a look at George Orwell's 1984. That book is usually read as if it were, um, you know, attempting to show you the evils of communism or fascism or Ivan's work. That is a book actually attempting to show you how horrible Christianity is. 
Catholicism in particular, but Christianity in general. So it's him to share how horrible Christianity is. And the interesting thing about that book, once you once you see it, it's like seeing the duck in the duck rabbit picture. Once you see it, you can't not see it in that book. Every major thing that we think about the Christian tradition, he's got it laid out in that book. God uses suffering to bring about the protagonist's love of the God figure in the story. And what the guy in the what the what the God figure in the story wants more than anything is for the protagonist Winston to love him. And he isn't going to force Winston to love him. He's just going to bring it about that Winston of his own accord does love him. And he succeeds. The God figure succeeds. And why does he succeed? Because in George Orwell's world, in the world of the story, universalism is true. In the end, everybody loves Big Brother. Everybody does. And if you watch what happens in a world like that, what you see is that at the end of the story, when Winston loves Big Brother and is blissful in loving Big Brother, Winston has lost himself entirely and he's a broken and pathetic specimen of a human being. And that's, um, that's I think, that's, I think, the right way to think about love. Big Brother is not vulnerable to Winston. And he doesn't want for Winston the good of being able to choose the way Big Brother can choose. So Marilyn had lots of wonderful things in her thought, and we shared a lot of uh, we shared a lot of uh, instincts and intuitions and stuff on that score. We just didn't see it the same way. The second part of this question, I think, we'll have to end here. Is this? Uh, what do you see as the role of disability, for example, uh, Harriet Tubman's neurological issues, uh, what do you see as the role of disability in the eschaton? Oh, I just love this question. I have loved all the questions. I seem to like best the one I just got. This is a wonderful question. Um, think about the question this way. The question asks, is there disability in heaven? Yeah. Um, now here, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. So if you say kindly, oh, of course, there's no disability in heaven, uh, the disabled will hand you your head on a platter. If you say there is disability in heaven, then um, people like Helen Keller, who couldn't wait to get to heaven to get rid of her disability, will think you're condemning them to everlasting torment. So what are you supposed to say? And um, I guess what I want to say is, with respect to heaven, every one of us is disabled. There are no humans without disabilities. Every one of us has got massive parts of the psyche that are broken and constitute a disability. But um, what happens to those broken parts in heaven depends entirely on what's the matter with them and your attitude toward them. So um, everyone in heaven is perfected, but what in you falls away and what in you is perfected is a function of your individual life. In other words, disabilities are, are like Christ wounds. They're neutral. They're neutral in themselves. They become glorious when they are uh, they become glorious when they are reminders of, of the love of Christ. But um, you could also imagine someone who had wounds. Francis had the stigmata. He had the wounds in his um, body that were like the wounds in Christ's body. But they seem to have been only painful and ugly. And maybe for him, those wounds would heal in the afterlife. So that's what I want to say about that question, which is a great question.